good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to today's call i am sankalp uh, i represent pmsif world and uh, you know if you have been uh, following us or have uh, keenly watching this space i am sure you would have heard of us and what we do uh, at the risk of being redundant i'll repeat a little bit about us uh, we are uh, determined to create an ecosystem of invest uh, informed investing uh, where investors do not just look at uh, the few popular products but uh, or the few popular names uh, of investment manager or you know are not to uh, spellbound by that but go actually at merit uh, we we do a keen analysis uh, of five factors which we call the 5p analysis which covers people philosophy portfolio performance and price of portfolios and uh, what this does is it throws up or it brings to us a lot of interesting uh, fund managers a lot of interesting portfolio and in that virtue and in that spirit today we have amongst us a very very special guest mr sachin shah uh, who is the fund manager at uh, mk investment managers and uh, let me let me just take a minute uh, to give you a little background of mr sachin as you were discussing before the call mr sachin is uh, you know has a rich experience of almost 2 to 2 and a half decades in the indian capital markets uh, mr sachin has uh, you know he he likes to call himself a keen learner and that is what i like about him and he has been associated uh, or he has worked previously with one of the uh, fifth few of the best in the investing uh, you know world in india ranging from nirmal jain uh, who started probity uh, uh, research uh, you know back in the days uh before IFL uh, was actually the nomenclature uh then he worked with one of india's most well known uh, investors mr ramdev agarwal at motilal oswal uh then he moved to mk with uh, where he's been associated with them for 9 9 and a half years almost right sachin uh, yeah so he he has this unique uh, you know uh, framework or unique philosophy called equal uh, which e slash quality which i am hoping we will get to know a little bit more on the call uh so that that is a little bit about uh, mr sachin i hope i have not missed anything important uh a little bit about mk so you know uh, mk has been uh, you know it's one of the uh, well known uh, uh, you know investment or uh, financial services house in the country uh, on their asset management side today they uh managed close to 550 uh, crore across pmss and ifs a little uh and you know they've been here for uh, 25 years now uh their eif uh, which uh you know has performed really well over the last one year, last one year and you know whatever the duration that uh, it has been has uh, beaten most of its benchmark their pmss also have done well and interestingly uh, their pms is also called lead so Uh, i think it has led in terms of returns also so i'll not hold uh, the audience any further and i'll hand over the stage to mr shah who can take us through his philosophy today and uh, we will be very happy to take questions as we uh, you know progress thank you over to you mr sachin thank you sankal thank you so much uh, good evening everyone it's uh, you know thank you so much for being with us it's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be part of today's presentation along with pms ai world uh, let me just uh, load my presentation in a second yeah so you know what i'm going to talk today about is uh, some of the investments that we have done in the last few years uh, how did we catch some of those investment trends what has been our thought process Uh, what has been our investment philosophy and you know uh, when we invest in those businesses uh, what is also important is uh, you know how do those businesses will create wealth and that that to sustainable wealth because if we want the compounding gain it has to be a sustainable wealth uh, so you know i strongly believe that we need to have a construct that every business needs to be you know each of those parameters needs to be there in those businesses for them to generate wealth and then of course identifying those investment trends will always help us a lot uh, you know accelerate our returns or to do little better than the overall uh, economy so uh, i will walk you through first to the business construct and uh, once we create that base because i believe uh, creating a base is very important and then from there on 
I will talk about the investment trends that we have invested in. I will be more, in fact, I will be uh, giving quite a few examples uh, specific to sectors, specific to companies, and how did or why did we like those businesses? Why did we like those sectors? And why did we select them over some of the other conventional uh, investment trends? So let's start with the business construct. So, you know, when I talk about the construct for the businesses uh, that is required or that is pertinent to generate wealth, I think the first thing that is very important is to look at the track record. So when we talk about the track record, it's all about looking at the historical numbers. Uh, and of course, when we talk about financial investing, it's also always about profit and loss, balance sheet, cash flow, because numbers speak a lot. Uh, numbers tell us what has gone through in the last few years, how did the company manage itself during the good times, during the bad times, all of that comes you know, in front of us. Uh, now what I have done here is I have mentioned in the order that we like to see uh, you know, how these numbers we look at. So for example, when I'm looking at uh, PNL, now PNL is actually just one particular Period. It could be for one year, it could be for say one quarter or say for half a year, but that's where it ends. When we look at balance sheet, it's a cumulative of last many years. And you know, every business goes through a good and a bad cycle. How did that business manage itself during a bad cycle will actually get reflected in a balance sheet. But you know, even with balance sheet, as somebody rightly said, you know, what it reveals is interesting, but what it conceals is much more exciting, right? So even in balance sheet, there are there can be a few hidden things. So for us, the most important thing is actually cash flows, because we strongly believe that cash flows do not lie. Uh, it's very, very difficult to manipulate cash flows. And if you look at in a block of three, four, five years, cumulative cash flows, it's even more difficult to you know, manipulate those cash flows. Of course, I agree that there will be certain exceptions, but they are truly, truly outliers. In my so many years of experience, at least in the Indian context, there are, you know, you can count on your fingertips how many companies can have done something, something wrong on the cash flow side. So this is something that we never miss. Cash flows is something that we are very, very cognizant about and we pay a lot of attention to it. So in that sense, track record is very, very important for us. The second important thing is the business scalability. Now, this is where it's very, very essential to understand your landscape. Because, you know, actually, if you think about it, India is a very large country with such a large population. For everything, there is going to be a large opportunity. But within those segments, how large can it be for you? Or can you actually even increase your landscape? Like, for example, uh, if you look at, say, the pharma industry, now, the domestic formulation industry is say, about rupees one and a half lakh crores, so it's about $20 billion. Now, if we think that the, can the Indian pharma industry also cater to the world markets? So if you just take the generics market, uh, it just multiplies the entire opportunity, right? Uh, and in fact, actually today, if you see the construct of the uh, Indian pharma industry, a $20 billion of revenue does come from the domestic formulations, but another $20 billion, which is equal size, comes from the generic market, the global generic market, which makes it $40 billion. And if I include some of the other businesses like the CDMOs and the CRAMs, that will be probably another $5 to $10 billion. So it's about almost $50 billion, which is only a $20 billion size. So to, you know, because the growth of our, the, the whole idea about growth will be dependent on the kind of the opportunity which is there. Uh, the other thing also very important is in terms of understanding the scalability is the industry structure, right? How fragmented the industry, the more the fragmented, a little more difficult it is. But there are certain industries which are very, very consolidated already. For example, if you look at the auto industry, now every segment within the auto industry, uh, it could be passenger vehicles, it could be uh, two wheelers, it could be commercial vehicles, the top two players or maximum the top three players will actually have about 70, 80% market share. So it's much more easier for us to decide on how do we invest in those businesses because where are they headed, it's much easier. Like for example, telecom industry, for last so many years now, we've seen the consolidation phase happening. And now the you know it's almost boiled down to three players and probably two players over a period of next one or two years. So you know it's much easier then to uh, make an investment call over there. 
the third, which is the inherent profitability, which is about the ROC and ROE percentages. Now, all of us know that return on capital employed and return on equity as a percentage is very important and critical because how much I did I invest and how much did I earn is something what we all like to know and we all like to have it higher and higher. But I think it's much more than that. The way I look at it is that this is actually the fuel for growth. You know, we all talk about growth, growth and growth, but to capitalize that growth, the opportunity size is very large, industry structure is good, but how does one capitalize on that growth? Because you will, one will have, uh, every company will have to actually reinvest a lot of money in the business to take it to the next level. Now for that to happen, you need to have your own internal accruals. And that's only possible if you have higher profits, higher ROCs, because that is truly your fuel for the next level of growth. So to my mind, this ROC and ROE are actually the, uh, they play a very big catalyst role in creating a very strong base for the next few years of growth. Now, the management quality. Now, you know, how much ever I emphasize on this, I think it's going to be less. Because if one looks at most of the companies that have created wealth in the last few years, I think the entire credit goes to management quality. Because there is opportunity size, there is a decent industry structure, but only a few of them are able to capitalize on it. You know, so many times we come across where managements are honest, but we don't find them capable. If they're capable, we don't find them honest. If they're honest and capable, they don't have the larger vision picture. You know, they always miss the bigger picture. So that's where your integrity, which is the honesty comes into play, which is the strategy, uh, you know, having a bigger picture, uh, in front of you are able to see and having the vision is very important and flawless execution. I think that's very, very critical. Uh, you know, executing to the T is something so important. Uh, you know, I mean, because we have seen so many managements where they are very honest, they have a good thought process, but they falter on the execution side. And, you know, as you would have seen in my uh, picture here, I very deliberately put it in a pyramid format where I'm really saying that what are, you know, what is the importance of each of these parameters? And I think management quality comes at the top of it. But when it comes to equity investing, see these four parameters are about how does the business generate wealth? How does the business create? How does the business go to the next level? How does it create its own scale, its own size, its higher profits, right? But when it comes to equity investing, I think there is one more very important point. And that is, the purchase price discipline. At what price do I invest in that stock? Because, you know, it's all this is all great, but if I have bought it at a wrong price, of course, first is you can't buy companies which do not take the first four. And then it's very important to have the right purchase price. And let me tell you one thing, in my so many years of experience, there is, you know, investing is actually about uh, science and art. And this valuation, which is the purchase price, is a lot to do with art. For example, if I look at number one, number two, number three, uh, a lot of it is science. We all have a lot of data. We can put it in a very structured format and we can decide this is eligible, this is not eligible. We can do all of that. I think management quality is a combination. Evaluating management quality is a combination of art and science. But when it comes to valuation, a large part of it is art. Let me give you a small example of it. In the year 2000, Infosys did a profit of about 300 crores. And in the year 2014, that company's profit grew to rupees 10,000 crores, which is 30x in 14 years, which effectively means more than 25% compounded, actually almost 27% compounded growth rate over 14 years. Now, if you think about Infosys is the best company and at that point in time, TCS wasn't listed. So Infosys was the number one company, the biggest IT company in that sense. Uh, you know, it had the, the, the opportunity size was the same for all the other IT companies also. But barring the top two, three or four companies, most of them were not able to scale up the way Infosys or a couple of them have been able to do it. Right. So, you know, it was the best company. 
they had the right opportunity size. Their ROCs at that point in time were very high, almost 40-50%. Uh, in terms of integrity, and I think integrity is not only to wealth, uh, I mean to the shareholders, but integrity towards your clients, integrity towards your employees, integrity towards your partners, integrity uh, with your shareholders, all the sticks were there. Strategy wise, they never missed the bigger picture and flawless execution. Because unless these three would have fallen in place, for Infosys to grow from 300 crores of profit to rupees 10,000 crores, today there are probably less than 10 companies. In 2014, there were less than five companies which made a profit of more than 10,000 crores in the Indian context. Today also, I think there will be less than 10 companies. So unless all of that would have fallen in place uh, in a big way, uh, I don't think Infosys would have reached that level. So all the ticks are absolutely in there. But let me tell you an interesting point there. An investor who invested money in Infosys, thinking that it will grow to $10,000 of profit in 2014, and obviously if you're growing at 25, 27% compounded rate in terms of profit, you definitely expect that you should make that kind of money. But the investor who invested money in 2000, uh, probably made in 2014, uh, you know, mid single digit return, maybe six, seven percent, which is probably similar or even below than the bank fixed deposit rates that was prevailing at that point in time. Right. So, you know, the only diff the only problem was that you bought it at a wrong valuation in spite of you getting it all right. And this is Infosys. Had you bought any other IT stock in those hey days, uh, even today, after 20 years, you would have lost 60, 70, 80 percent of the money. So buying the right purchase price, I think it's a very, very important element when it comes to equity investing. Uh, so this is all very, very pertinent. There is no doubt about it. And I would say that this construct has to be always in your background when we are trying to look at investment trends. Uh, but is it enough? That's the question. That's the real question, right? Uh, so from that perspective, uh, what I would like to say is that every business goes through a good and a bad cycle. The question is where we invest our money, does it have those do those business have tailwinds? We need to really catch those tailwinds where the businesses are able to grow a little faster than the GDP growth. They have certain catalysts which are going to come into the play. And that is where I talk about, you know, the swim with the current, right? Uh, and this this construct for the businesses that generate wealth will be my principles where I would I would not like to compromise on them. Now, finding investment trends and then finding companies within those investment trends along with this business construct is something which is how we work out here. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, now if we look at one of the trends that we invested in the last four or five years, or actually the last two, three years, uh, but let me get back, uh, let me take you to about three or four years back. So sometime here around 2013, 14, 15, 16, the Indian pharma markets actually did quite well. And, uh, you know, a large part of that growth came from the US generics market. Now, when I talk about the US generic market, what happened in sometime around US, uh, sometime around 2015-16 is that the, the buyer side uh, had a lot of consolidation. So in the sense that the entire 80 to 90 percent of the market now is controlled by only three or four buyers in the US. Now, when that happens, the bargaining power of the sellers, which is the generic manufacturers, has got diluted quite significantly. Uh, so, and that continues even today for, for last four years. So clearly there is going to be some impact on the profitability. On one side, you have more and more suppliers there are more and more companies who are getting into the generic space, not only from India, but from a lot of other countries like Israel and many other places. At the same time, your buyers have got consolidated. So now you have only two or three people who you have to bargain with. And obviously they have the higher bargaining power. So what we did is we started focusing on few other segments in the pharma uh, almost three years back, or actually DV's lab is one thing that we invested more than five or six years back, which is the cram space, the contract research and manufacturing space, the CDMO space. Uh, now, you know, if you think about the CDMO space, 
what is the opportunity size? What is the business scalability over there? In terms of business scalability, it's almost a hundred billion dollar market at this point in time. Most of the large pharma companies are growing their R&D budgets at the rate of about three to five percent. But what they outsource is much more than what they are spending every year. So the outsourcing market, which is the contract research and the manufacture or the CDMO market, is growing at about five to seven percent every year on a hundred billion dollar market. Uh, today, I think mo- most of the large global pharma companies actually outsource nearly 25% of their R&D budgets. Uh, in fact, most of the biotech companies are actually outsourcing their entire 100%. So that's the size of the opportunity that we see. Uh, there are very high entry barriers because uh, you know these are very high sensitive IP related businesses. Because when a large pharma company, if they are doing some R&D work, they do not they, they want to. You know, these are like intellectually property, uh, which they would like to keep it as much secret as possible. And from that perspective, these companies have to gain a lot of confidence uh, from these global pharma companies. Uh, And because the entry barriers are high, the profitability is also high. So companies which were DV's lab, Suwen Pharma, Laura's labs, uh, in this cramps business, they all make about 25, 30, 40 percent kind of profits, uh, you know, on a continuous basis. So that also takes into the inherent profitability of the the tick bosses that we like to have a look at. The other thing is in terms of the management quality, if you look at DV's lab, they have been around for almost now 15, 20 years. And you know, generally whenever we invest, it's not that we would have just looked at that company as on yesterday or day before yesterday. We would have observed that management, we would have observed their strategy, we would have observed their actions. Uh, and we have a very special module about equal risk on our proprietary side, which is what we use to scan all these companies. Because a lot of companies will talk a lot of things, but do they walk the talk? It's something very important. So we got a lot of takes when we evaluated DV's lab uh, in terms of the management integrity, in terms of their capability, and also in terms of the strategy. Uh, so that is how we looked at CRAMS and CDMO business. Uh, that is how we figured out these investment trends and we invested quite significantly uh, in all these companies in the last three years. In fact, DVs has been with us for more than five to six years now. But because we saw that DVs has been doing quite well, we started looking at more companies in that sector and uh, we were able to identify companies like Suwen Pharma and Laura's Labs. Incidentally, some of these companies also have a very, very strong uh, domain expertise on chemical synthesis and which is where they have uh, use that those expertise for the large API manufacturing uh, and you know trying to create very very large scale manufacturing base which helps them economies of scale and because of their uh, expertise on the chemical synthesis side they become very very efficient players so this com- uh, so large API manufacturers uh, where they are able to uh, you know create new processes and make it much more efficient so that the cost of production keeps on going down and they become one of the lowest cost producers is something what uh, you know is very helpful. Uh, the third segment in the pharma segment that we have identified is that you know a lot of companies today are you know fighting in the generic space but there are very few companies who are actually going in the specialty products and specialty products to some extent is almost like a patented product in the in the developed markets be it US, be it Japan, be in some of the European markets. So where they are able to do this, uh, you know, uh, companies like say Sun Pharma, they've almost invested a $1 billion in the last five, six years for the specialty business. A company which is a very small company, Suwain Pharma, or now it's renamed as Suwain Life Science. Uh, the promoter has given his 100%, uh, you know, for this basic research and development. Uh, it's just a matter of time that the luck will come to him and he, he will get his own success. But he has uh, almost dedicated more than three decades of his life. Uh, he has invested heavy sums of money, uh, which got generated from his other cramps business. So the cramps business was funding his R&D business. And uh, now that he has got in pipe almost three or four products on his basic research, he has also started, uh, he has created two separate companies because now he's quite confident that over a period of time, he will be able to generate cash from his R&D company itself. So these are some of the trends on the pharma side is somewhat we had 
uh, evaluated. Uh, now, the second is real estate. If I go back to say six, seven, eight years back, say in about 2006, 2007, 2008, uh, the real fancy in the stock markets was for the real estate companies. But most of these real estate companies were actually the residential real estate companies. And when we evaluated some of these companies, uh, you know, they were not fitting in some of our construct. So either they did not have the right track record or they were they did not have a national region kind of scalability because they were some of the very regional plays or in terms of profitability, again, not so great. Uh, and most importantly, the strategy in terms of the management uh, strategy, uh, which was the most put off. Like, for example, uh, you know, most of these promoters uh, were just buying land, land, land. Like they bought, you know, I don't know, a few hundreds of acres of land, each of them. And which they, uh, I don't think they had any vision how much in how much time frame will they be able to uh, capitalize on this in the sense how how quickly they will be able to build on this land and sell the apartments to the you know the the house uh, seekers so from that perspective I think the you know in fact actually if I can use the word they almost behave like Jagirdas so you know as if uh, but you are, you are you are working for a public limited company so you need to you can have a five year kind of a plan where you can have that kind of land bank and then you build and grow over things but that was not the thought process that they had. So, but you know, silently, what we saw is that in the year 2008, 9, 10, uh, some of the large foreign private equity investors had started investing in the commercial real estate, and that is one of the trends that we started picking up. That they were very happy investing in commercial real estate, where they were getting about nine percent, ten percent kind of yields, and when they uh, you know, and in fact, they almost committed two billion dollars each of them. Like GIC invested two billion dollars in a span of three, four years. Uh, I think even BlackRock invested. In fact, as on today, in the last seven, eight years, all the private equity investors put together, all the global private equity investors have put together invested almost fourteen billion dollars in the commercial real estate. And as on today, they are very happy, even getting about seven percent, seven and a half percent kind of rental yields. So that was another trend that we picked up that this is uh, because as the third point is that as the interest rates actually go down, the value of your rental income actually keeps on increasing because the rental income grows, but the interest rate goes down. So the valuation, the capitalization rates are much better. Uh, that was another very interesting point. I think this pra uh, global private equity investors could see because they could see that global interest rates, at least they anticipated that the global interest rates are going to go down. And from that perspective, it made a lot of sense for them to invest in assets which are yielding them today 10 percent, 11 percent, you know, kind of yields. Uh, another very important trend that also came up was REITs. Now, REITs has always been a very large uh, global uh, market and very efficient for investors. So from that perspective, we said we need to look at some of the commercial real estate companies. Uh, and one of the companies that we could identify was Nesco. Uh, I remember in the year about 2009, when I met this company, uh, in terms of track record, it had cleaned up its balance sheet, it had become debt free, they had almost 50 crores of profit at that point in time. In terms of scalability, they had not even scratched the surface for the kind of the land they have because they have nearly 65 acres of land uh, in the heart of Mumbai and uh, they had plans to you know, build, that, build uh, IT parks over there. In terms of the profitability, it was very decent when you look at the rental incomes, uh, kind of the rents that the Mumbai commercial real estate yields and the kind of the construction cost because they already had land. So they just had to spend for the construction cost and the rental income. If you see the profitability was almost 20, 30 percent at that point in time for them. Uh, in terms of the management, uh, the best thing that I liked about was the strategy. Uh, I asked them, what's your plan going on from here on in the year 2009? And the management told me two things. We have two plans. First is we will never take debt. That's point number one. And point number two, they said that whatever cash flows that we generate from our existing business, which is the exhibition center and some bit of the IT park that they had at that point in time, we will reinvest all that money to build more IT parks and generate even a larger pool of rental income. You know, this was 2009. Today we are in 2020, it's 11 years. Uh, and the management has exactly walked the talk. And even today, they have only this two-line strategy. 
And if you see today, they are already a 300 to 400 kind of a rental income. Uh, they have profits, which is March 20 declared of almost 200 crores. If I add to that one new more IT park that they have already started, uh, I think the profits will go to 300 to 350 crores in the post COVID environment. And, uh, you know, the, the, today they are, they continue to be debt free, not only debt free, but they have nearly 600 crores of cash on balance sheet. So, you know, this is how we look at it. And this is where we've made our pick on the real estate. We, we looked at, uh, you know, annuity rental incomes compared to the land bank NAV kind of valuations. <clears throat> Now automobiles, this is one sector which we all understand. We know it has a very large potential looking at the demographics of the country, the kind of the population that we have. Uh, in fact, in terms of the penetration, we are the lowest probably among the world, right? But yet this industry goes through a lot of cycles and this it's very, very cyclical. It has deep cycles. So what we said is that if we invest in the pure local OE players, OE's original equipment, uh, which is the Marukis and the heroes of the world, uh, you know, they all will have the cycle, cycles. We have seen this in the last 20 years, at least that I have seen. And each segment, whether it's passenger vehicle, whether it's two wheelers, commercial vehicles are even more cyclical. So, you know, that was a challenge over there. If we look at the auto ancillary businesses, uh, you know, the biggest challenge is that not too many auto ancillaries have been able to scale up the business. And the second part has been that you know, there is very low profitability because auto ancillaries are always at the mercy of the OEs because when they supply to some of these original equipment manufacturers, the bargaining power that they have is very limited. So the profitability is also very low. So what we said is that we should look at companies that not only serve the Indian market, but also the global markets, right? So that is why where the term the global comes into the play. So we identified companies like Sesundaram Fasteners uh, where almost 30 to 40 percent of their revenue is exports, largely the U.S. markets. Uh, we identified Timken India, where 75 percent of its business comes from exports, industrials, and railway. So the pure auto will be just 25 percent. Uh, you know, which is a which is not a bad thing for a bearing company. Uh, we also looked at Aisha Motors. Now this company has been largely domestic, the Royal Enfield bikes. But if you see in the last two years, the management focus has been significant on the global markets. The, the key management person, which is Mr. Lal, who actually built uh, Royal Enfield in the new Avatar in the last 10 years, where, you know, we all know Royal Enfield has become a household name today. He has shifted his focus, his personal focus completely to the global markets. And he already got some success. So that is how we selected Aisha Motors also over some of the other, uh, you know, local OE players. The other very important thing, as I mentioned about the profitability. So if you see the company that we have selected, Sundaram Fastenal has got a profitability of at an OPM of about 20%, operating margin of about 20%. Timken also similar and Aisha Motors actually about 25 to 30%. But we have to understand that this operating profit is only possible if the gross margins are higher. So Sundaram Fastenal has a gross margin of almost 60%. Uh, same does Tim can have about 60%. And, you know, this is where it shows that the kind of the value addition that these businesses do. Uh, and that's why they are, in spite of them being supplied to some of the large OEs, OEs do appreciate that and they allow them to make this kind of money. Uh, the other very important thing is the scalability of the business. You know, Aisha Motors today sells just about maybe 8 lakhs, 9 lakhs, maximum in the best case scenario, they'll probably sell about 10 lakh bikes in the next year or that's been their peak kind of a thing in a total, uh, you know, two crore bike market, right? But if you see the profits that they make is almost 60% of the market leader. So that's how what we also look at the scalability. Sundaram Fasna is already a half a billion dollar company. The vision of the management is to quickly take it to a billion dollars. But if I know them well, I don't think they are going to stop at anything less than $2 billion. That's the fire. That's the hunger that they have you know, uh, to grow the business and they have all the impediments for them uh, take it to, to take them to that level, whether it's the track record of their business, uh, you know, like Sundaram Fastnaz is more than a 40, 50 year old company, uh, amazing track record in terms of the, uh, you know, it's one of the few companies that I know in this country, uh, which has not had any labor strike in the last 50 years of their history. 
So that speaks of the pedigree of the management, right? Uh, so that's about autos. Now, another very interesting thing, we all know that India, the consumption is rapid, you know, is rising very, very rapidly. And from that perspective, uh, you know, investing in the consumption theme is very, very important. But most of the traditional companies, which are the FMCG companies, have been trading at very, very high valuation. So in our construct, they wouldn't probably fit in the, the valuation part of the whole thing. But then when we say, when we looked at a little more deeper, we saw that some of the lifestyle consumptions is also a new trend that's emerging. So be it travel for leisure, be it on the healthcare side, or the new, I would say, probably oxygen, which is the data. You know, today, uh, I think it's it's taken uh, it's taken a shape which is above roti, kapra, and makan also. So data is something which is uh, the digital, the consumer, uh, the digital revolution at the consumer end. I think that's a very important thing which is uh, playing out. So how did we play out uh, or how have we invested in some of these trends? I'll, I'll share that. So when we looked at the travel trend, what we realized is that most of the upper middle class families uh, you know, have started uh, taking more than one breaks a year. It's in fact they almost went to two or three breaks every year when it came to their uh, leisure vacations. Now with that trend, uh, obviously, one of the best place was hotels. But when we look at most of the hotels, they do not fall. You know, they do not uh, actually uh, have the right construct in the sense that hotels is a very very cyclical business. It's a very asset heavy business. Uh, they do not have the right inherent profitability with most of them. So these are serious challenges with hotel businesses. Uh, but then when we looked at this company called Mahindra Holidays, uh, it's a, it's a it's a absolutely unique business model. Here, the, the company doesn't have to invest for its growth. The, its, its customers, the customers of the company, which is the members of the Mahindra holidays, they fund them to build the new resorts for themselves. So the company over here has actually invested, uh, you know, company has actually built almost 3,500 rooms in the last 20 years of its existence uh, with almost no capital invested from its own balance sheet. All the money that they have invested is from the money that they would have collected from their customers, right? And that's why they generate huge amount of free cash flow. Of course, there were some challenges uh, post the IPO times. And as I said, that when we invest in businesses, we've been watching the track record for a while and we just don't jump into it. And we knew the problems that they, they were created uh, from 2009 till 2013 14. But sometime around 2013 14, the management acknowledged those challenges they actually corrected the course and also at the same time what they did is uh, they, they started completely re-strategizing and going back to their customers and working uh, very very strongly on that and now the proof of the pudding is as we can see that today they had their cash balance of less than 50 crores in sometime 2014 and today they are almost at 800 crores of cash on their balance sheet so this is a very unique business model that we are participating in for the travel uh, trend. When I also look at uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the healthcare side, you know, today one of the very important things is that the, you know, for most of the families, the maximum number amount of incremental spending that happens is on the education and the healthcare side. So on the healthcare side, we looked at hospitals. Because today in India, the potential, I mean, today, if you look at, we all understand the COVID, uh, we all are completely exposed. Our healthcare system has got completely exposed uh, how, how under invested we are in it uh, with this COVID. We all know the kind of the shortages of the hospital beds that we all are facing. So we, we said that this is where the potential is very large. And uh, one of the reasons why people are not able to spend is because they don't have insurance. So as the penetration of insurance increases, the need for the hospital beds is going to increase. The need for the healthcare is going to increase. So that is where we identified the company Nara and Arundalaya. And uh, it did, uh, you know, again, it had a very differentiated business model compared to other hospitals. Like, for example, uh, they were actually having, a, you know, they did a relatively asset light model as compared to the others in the sense that most of the other hospitals were owning their own land. They were building their own buildings. 
whereas narana rudalaya actually went on the lease model or went with partnership with some other investors and they were only managing the hospitals and the equipments so that not only helped them create uh, efficiency in terms of the profitability but it also kept them under leveraged which is a very important thing uh, when we are, one is running a business to make to, you know to maintain the risk uh, capacity or the risk management similarly with hdfc life uh, all these years before it was privatized uh, when we were all having lic only i think it was largely utilized as a savings product rather than an insurance product after privatization again ulip took a very uh, big thing and that's why again it became more of a savings product rather than an insurance product but hdfc life has been innovative they were always very focused on uh, you know offering very very specialized pure insurance products be term insurance or you know some of those products and uh, the other important thing is to to sell insurance to such a large country of almost 120 crores you need a very wide distribution network and uh, because of their parentage uh, hdfc bank is one of the big uh, they have a bank insurance but that's a bankable bank a lot of banks uh, you know may would like to sell uh, non banking products but they are not successful hdfc bank has been at the top of the charts be it, you know selling mutual funds to their customers be it selling insurance to their customers or any of the other non banking services uh hdfc bank has been at the top of the charts and that is where hdfc life has been very very successful and another very important thing about hdfc life is the culture of the group they are extremely extremely focused about their profitable uh, growth so and and at the right with the right risk so uh, keeping the risk management in play and making profits is something which is inherent to the hdfc culture we have seen with hdfc limited we have seen with hdfc bank now we are seeing with hdfc life we have seen also with hdfc amc so that is also very important <clears throat> on the on the data on the consumer uh, digital revolution side i think we all know when i look all around uh, whether it is uh, my security guard whether it is the office boys whether it is the chauffeur uh i think if we if we keep a meal for them they will be fine as long as the data is going on as long as they are watching their movie uh in their idle time or in or most of the time i think they are they are very happy and now that uh, this integration is happening uh for the entertainment for retail so we moved from telecom to retail to entertainment everything and from that perspective this is a very very large revolution Simultaneously, we have seen the entire industry going through a huge consolidation phase. We are now left with three players, with two players being very profitable. And from that perspective, I think uh, this is also a very interesting play for the next at least three to five years. We strongly believe that both these companies, with Reliance Jio and Bharti Airtel, uh, will continue to do very well uh, with the with the consumers queuing up just to use data uh, as if there is nothing else in this world. <clears throat> uh you know it services we all know has been one of the biggest wealth creators for uh, most of the investors in the last few years uh but somewhere it also has become a commoditized services so we said let's focus on some of the other new emerging trends so we identified all the future technologies so we identified a company called tata alexi uh which has been extremely focused on uh you know embedded software and they have identified three sector which is auto media and healthcare so within auto also their large focus is with autonomous vehicles commercial cars evs which is the future of the automobile industry within media ott platforms is where they were always focused on i can't even say it's the future because it's already now live everybody is now on netflix and the amazons of the world we all are consuming all the content largely on the ott platforms so that's another very big trend and uh, on the healthcare side also uh particularly now with covid and otherwise also i think even pre covid we have seen a lot of medical devices where there was lot of operations happening on the remote side so even that's been a very big trend uh and which is where companies like tata alexi should benefit in a significant way now infrastructure has been one of the most important uh you know opportunities for this country in fact i think it's almost like an unavoidable opportunity because as a country we are completely starved of infrastructure we need better roads we need better highways we need better ports we need better airports i mean we need i think even better railway stations 
uh, but you know uh, there are very few companies which have actually created wealth for themselves as a company they have not grown so large in terms of the profitability or you know whichever we look at it they have not done anything great and even for shareholders not not too many companies have created wealth and simply because most of them miss this construct of having the scalability or in having the profitability or the cash flows in place right so the company that we identified is a gujarat pipa power port now this company is probably one of the few infrastructure companies in the country which is debt free not only that they have a free cash flow not only that they they whatever profits that they make they actually pay out fully so you know they have really created an asset where they understand how how efficiently they have been able to do it and it is owned by a multinational company which is apm mars which is the largest shipping line in the country so in terms of management quality also most of the ticks are there <clears throat> so sachin uh, hi sorry to interject uh, yeah. we will uh, can we conclude the presentation part quickly so that we can take a few questions so we have yeah. also done a few polls while you were speaking so i've got some interesting insights to share from the poll as well sure Thanks. so uh, uh, actually sanket so i just have probably one or two more uh, trends to talk about and then i'll just conclude sure yeah i'll run through that sure yeah so this is the you know i think another very important thing is the export side because you know all said and done every business goes through a cycle similarly every country has its own cycle so de risking our portfolios from the you know country cyclical gdp growth is also very very important in fact some of the sectors that i mentioned pharma sector it sector uh, even the auto and auto accessory which are export oriented they all have exports inbuilt and that is where it really helps us uh, we have also invested in couple of niche plays which is a uh, coffee manufacturer which is ccl products uh, a chemical outsourcing company which is navin florin so these are some of the businesses that we have also invested in uh i think in the interest of time i will hold on myself over here and over to you sankar <clears throat> sure so uh, let me just share a few insights while you were talking we conducted few quick polls and uh, the last question that i asked to the audience was uh if they have added health insurance cover in the last few months 55% of them said yes uh while 44% said no so another interesting uh, you know poll that we had uh, while you uh, while you was uh, live was we asked audiences where they want to invest in the next 10 years from large cap indian equity small cap equities uh, multi cap equities or global equities so uh, 42% said they want to invest in multi cap equities and a striking 11% said they want to look at uh, global equities uh, you know read us equities interestingly uh, among the trends that we think uh, you know are Uh, that, that the audience thinks is uh, going to be strong for the next 10 years information technology 39% of the audience feels is going to do well uh, surprisingly bfsi and fmcg which were the darlings uh, only 10% people feel that they will do uh, you know well in the next decade but that's for time to say so uh, you know we uh, we uh, had a very insightful discussion you explained a lot of things so uh you know uh what what i will uh, what my first question to you is going to be uh you know back in the days of 2008 9 since you've mentioned a lot of those days i bought a product called microsoft zoom i am sure most of the people on the call don't even remember what the product was uh so this was an ipod competitor competitor and uh the trend was heavy for uh you know I, ipods then so what my point is uh you know if a, you know what doesn't trend you know gets beaten very badly and if you and if you had bet on zoom doing well you would have been hurt so the question is how do you choose trends you know or you know you spend some time on explaining trends that have done well that you think will do well the question to you is how do you uh, you know how do you choose a trend how do you build that conviction around the trend uh, maybe take some time and uh, you know explain uh, to us thank you sankar pol i think that's a very very interesting question so you know the key thing is that that is where our research comes into play and when i talk about research it includes multiple things you know so you know for example uh, i spoke about that we looked at the uh, pharma trend which is the cdmo trend right so one of the important things which i had learned from someone is that when you work in a large company uh, you should always keep your eyes and ears open now you know i have been with mk global for almost 9 10 years now 
and you know mk global actually has a very large r and d uh, i mean large research unit for their mk global broking business so this is about 4 years back or 3 and a half years back uh, i was interacting with our pharma analyst and we were just discussing that if the us generic market is a challenge this is a challenge you know uh, where do and even the domestic formulations market at that point in time was not growing very aggressively it was in low single digits so we said where is the opportunity and that's when we talked about the cdmo and then we started deep diving it then we looked at companies like bv's lab because we were already invested and we understood some of the trends right so you know you have to keep your eyes and ears open and you will get a lot of cues and that is where the research comes into play for example i mentioned you know sometimes also interacting with a lot of our companies uh, gives us those inflection points like for example when i invested in bv's lab Uh, they were doing very well and all of that, but we increased our bet significantly almost around three or four years back, or uh, actually three years back, because you know in our interaction with the management at the AGMs, uh, what we realize is that the management is now planning to invest in terms of new capex, almost rupees twelve hundred to fourteen hundred crores. Now, if I look at the history, in the last six seven years they had invested less than thousand crores. and now the management is talking about investing another 12 to 1400 crores in the next 2 years right so obviously this management has been very very prudent they have created this kind of you know rois and rocs and if they are thinking of investing 1200 to 1400 crores there is clearly a very big trend that is going to play out for this businesses as we go ahead or as i mentioned about the real estate companies there was a clear trend where the large global private equity investors were committing billions of dollars to this business so this kind of trends uh, one will have to keep their eyes and ears open one will have to keep on reading a lot and to do a lot of and this is actually what is research is all about research is not about uh, you know you you picking up an annual report today understanding and just going in and invest no it's about as i mentioned about the trend about when you look around the kind of the traveling the leisure trends are happening so as you deep dive more into it you will realize uh, that this is a trend which is picking up all around <clears throat> okay so uh, the basic is uh, that you try to keep your ears and eyes on the ground and see uh, what are businesses that could be trending that's right. okay, yeah. a very interesting take uh, and i'm sure mk uh, as a group uh, is quite uh, handy there so the next question that i want to ask you is uh, you know like a uh, like a part of my previous question said uh, trends hurt if you know if they go the other way so uh, what could be a possible you know like i'm sure investors on this call would want to know that what could be the pitfalls of uh, you know trying to spot a trend or you know the red flags that if you get a trend wrong uh, you know uh, just to say a lot of people would have expected a uh, uh companies like uh, media companies which are listed on the you know browsers there are very few of them to do well however i am sure even you know when covid came in and people are cons- uh, you know confined to their homes i don't think there's a lot of traction there despite a lot of uh, you know uh, being a lot of uh, entertainment shifting to these platforms this is just one example uh, how do you think uh, this can be detrimental or a red flag like i said uh you know while looking at trends yeah that's also very interesting see the key thing is that these trends don't emerge overnight these trends will always evolve over a period of time and that's why the markets will give you enough opportunity enough time to build on it right so that's the first thing that they will always evolve and as you know uh as you as you keep on walking towards time uh, you know as the trends keep on building you will keep on getting more and more confirmations right so as i said uh, for example uh, you know uh, like the real estate trend that i spoke about so it started with uh, the 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 foreign investors investing in the money then we talked about the interest rates going down that was the second trend then the third is about the risks coming into the play right so there were many parameters which you know which come into play and that is how the trends or a broader trend gets emerged also we have to understand that parallelly when i am looking at the trends i am not giving up on my basic constructs the companies that i am investing in they will have those constructs so even if the trends probably don't emerge my margin of safety my safety net is going to be always there 
because the business construct is very much there. Those companies have a good track record, good management quality. They have all of it. So what will happen? You will make a normal return. You will not make an exceptional return if the trend doesn't emerge because they will always be in uh, you know much better performing companies within their sector. But if the tailwind of the sector doesn't come, they will grow probably less than otherwise they would have grown if the tailwind was there. Right, right. So uh, you know, uh, you know the next question, which in fact while you were answering, I was thinking uh, in my mind. Is, so Aristotle is one of my favorite philosophers. He said, what we do repeatedly is what we, what makes us. You've been managing money for 20, 25 years now, nine years with MK. You mentioned a philosophy called equal. Okay. So you just, you just brushed uh, by it. So since you do this day in and day out, it's part of your DNA. It's part of your, it's part of who you are. So I think the audience uh, is interested in knowing trends, uh, but also this is one important aspect to the trend. So your philosophy or how you look at uh, it. So uh, please take some time and explain to us what equal is or what uh, you know what it has developed over the years with your learning. Over to you. Sure, Sankal. So this is, uh, thank you actually, I'm thankful to you because this is, uh, I have a couple of slides on this, which I thought in the possibility of time I did not share, but now since you've asked, probably I, I, talk, I will take that liberty and talk about it. So it's much easier for everyone to grasp on it. So basically, equal risk is a module, which is MK qualitative risk analysis. What we said is that, you know, management quality, we all like to say it has to be very good. The pedigree has to be great, all of this. But, you know, management quality effectively is actually becoming a very subjective thing. Like, for example, two of us would go and meet a management. A management will talk everything that is music to our ears, right? Uh, but, you know, once we come out, uh, I will say, wow, this is great. This is superb. They are going to do great. And you will say, oh, he was bullshitting. How do we know what he's saying is right or wrong? You know, all of that. So how do we actually make this entire exercise very objective to get the subjectivity out? So what we said is that we should look at the, you know, what are the action points? Whatever management say is saying is fine, but are they walking the talk? What has been their actions in the past will actually tell us how credible they are. So I will tell you one of the modules that we have created and I will share that on the screen. Just one second. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Sankalp, are you able to see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. I can see. I can see the screen. Maybe you can just sure. go into slide mode. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So you know, this is what our basic construct is for the whole thing. So we said when when I want to evaluate management quality, uh, I would like to look at four or five basic points. So like what management integrity? Are they honest enough? Uh, capability? Are they efficient enough? Uh, also in terms of wealth distribution, do they share the wealth with the minority shareholder? That's also very critical. Uh, investor communication, because you know our job is to do research. So unless we get the right information from the uh, from the companies, I will not be able to do the right analysis. So I need investor communication is also very important and critical. And then of course also liquidity, because if I have to participate, I need enough liquidity in the stocks to invest. So this is something where we evaluate management uh, quality. Uh, I will just talk a little bit more. So for example, now management integrity. We all talk about that we would like to have honest management. Now, how do I decide who is honest and who is dishonest? I don't want to have any prejudices or any biases towards anything. So we said we look at action points. We will look at data which is publicly available for all companies. So there's an apple to apple comparison, right? So we said look at promoter holding. The idea is that higher the promoter holding, uh, lower the probability that they will do something silly because they have enough amount of skin in the game, right? So what we have done is say, uh, this is our own subjective thing, but what we said is say, if I, in my entire construct of 100%, for promoter holding, if I give 7.5% weightage, now today SEBI's maximum shareholding allowed is say 75%. So every management which probably owns maybe 65, 70% plus, I will give full 7.5% marks. If a management has about 50 to 70%, I will give probably 5% weightage. If they are between 30 to 50%, I'll give probably 2.5%. If they are below 30%, I will not give them any marks, right? 
Uh, at the same time, has the promoter holding increased or decreased? If they have been increasing the shareholding, I will give probably positive marks. If they have decreased, I will give negative marks. Uh, another very important thing is promoter group salary as a percentage of profits. You talked about the media companies. You know, the problem with the media companies has been that with most of the large media companies, the construct has not been there. The cash flows has been wrong. Or in fact, one of the large media companies I know, at least till five or seven years back, the husband and the wife, both of them put together, were drawing a salary of more than 200 crores when the profits were under 500 crores. So almost 30, 40% of the profits or maybe 25, 30% of the profits were going to promoter salary. Now, you know, up to 5%, up to 7%, up to 10% is acceptable of the total profits. But anything beyond 10%, uh, you know, is something not something that we do not like. So this is, or who are your auditors? That's another very way to look at it. Are they among the big four? Are they among the known auditors? Or are they among the unknown auditors? So these are some of the pointers which really help us evaluate companies in a very, very objective way. Uh, you know, that's how that's how we look at it. Now, if you, if you look at the management capability, which is a very another very important thing of how efficient the management is, because just being honest is not enough. You also need people who are, you know, who are smart, right? They have to finally, at the end of the day, make money and create wealth for the, all the stakeholders. So, you know, that's also very important. So how well have they managed the debt equity ratio? Because every, when, when, the, when the business went down, like, a, like an environment like this, there were for two or three months, businesses did not have any business. Uh, uh, there were no revenue, there was no sales, there was, and there were only costs. How have the companies managed? I think companies which will emerge stronger out from here, they're going to go a very long way. Uh, when they do CAPEX, how capital cost efficiency they are. Do they have, do, are they able to finish their projects within the time, within the budgets, or they have a lot of cost overruns, time overruns, that also plays an important role. So these are some of the very important things that we follow, uh, you know, when it comes to equal risk. I hope I'm able to address what you were looking for. Right, right. So we, we have an understanding of what an equal, uh, you know, the property, uh, so equal uh, framework is. So I did an interesting poll in the meanwhile. I asked, uh, you know, how many people have visited at least once the website of the stock they have bought? Uh, interestingly, 20% haven't, but I'm happy 80% of the people have at least, you know, visited the website of the stock they bought. So that shows that as an investor community, we are evolving and I hope, uh, you know, we get better uh, in the coming days, we get more informed. So another question that, you know, uh, that I want to ask is, Sachin, you remember uh, we were discussing tennis before the call and you said you like underdogs when I asked you about Frederick and, you know, uh, Nadal. So uh, that brings me to an interesting question of valuations. Okay. So how do you look at valuations? Uh, you know, uh, you just touched through, but a lot of people interestingly asked this question because sabko laga tha ki COVID ke baad ek mandi aayegi, kafi lambi mandi, gehri mandi chalegi. You know, uh, but it it happened otherwise. Uh, so uh, with that, what's your view on valuation uh, when you construct a portfolio and when you spot trend? Because in my understanding, if a trend is going strong and the conviction builds on, companies are likelier to get uh, even more valuation rich. So if you can just uh, share your thoughts on this. Sure. So I, I will talk about that in a bit, but on a lighter note, you said it happened otherwise, but let me say for sure, we are not complaining. <laughs> right. So, uh, so on the valuation front, uh, of course there will be different business models or different industries will have different valuations. But as a general thing, okay, as a, as a very, as a very thumb rule kind of a thing, the way I look at it is that when I value companies, there are three very, you know, we generally, most of the time we look at the P ratios, right? But how do you decide what P is right and what P is wrong, right? So P ratio standalone to my mind has no meaning. It has to be looked in the context. And what are these context, context? So I look at three very important parameters whenever I want to assign a P valuation to a particular business, right? And these three contexts are first is growth. What is my growth outlook for the next two, three, four years? That's the first parameter. Second is what is the ROE? What is the return on equity that the company generates? That's also very important. And let me tell you, growth is dependent on ROE. You can't have too much of growth without a decent ROE. That's almost certain, unless you are doing something very disruptive. And the third is the size of the company, because the size also matters. The smaller you are, the more vulnerable you are to the external challenges, 
uh, say like COVID, you are very vulnerable to the external challenges. But the bigger you are, you can really, uh, you know, withhold a lot of storms. So if you are a larger in size, you will command a better premium in P valuations. If you have a better ROE, you will again have a better premium valuations. And if you have a high growth, that will definitely help you get much better peace. Because, you know, I, again, I will tell you, when I mentioned these three, the weightage to each of them is very different. It's not equal weightage. There will be a very high weight to the growth, which is almost probably maybe 60, 65%. To the ROEs, I'll probably assign about 20, 25%. And to size also maybe another 5 to 15%. So these are three very important parameters that I really focus on when I have to assign a valuation. And, you know, because when we talk about P, I'll just take one more minute. Because when we talk about P, what does it mean? If I say a stock is 20 P, if you think about it, effectively it means that today I'm earning 100 rupees. The stock is trading 2000 rupees. So it's a P of 20. So if I continue to 100 rupees every year, my payback will be 20 years. Right? That 20p effectively means that if there is no growth in your earnings, the payback for you will be about 20 years. Right? But when you assign a growth to your 100 rupees, suppose 100 will go to 120, 130, 140, your payback will be much less than 20 years because your 2000 you will reach much before the 20 years. Now, when you have a higher growth, it could be 10 years, it could be 7 years, it could be 5 years. So higher the growth, quicker the payback better I don't mind paying the higher P. Well, I'm happy with the seven year payback. I will assign that kind of a P. So that's that's how I look at valuations. So you are from the Newtonian school of thought that nothing is ever devoid of relativity. Good. So uh, I mean, that's an, that's an important insight because different yeah. people have different uh, takes on valuation. It's always interesting to know. So, uh, you know, this is probably the last two questions that I'm going to ask you. So one is uh, a more, uh, you know, first, if you can answer this, what offerings does MK as a as a house have for its investors? Uh, what kind of uh, products uh, MK has and uh, who do you think uh, is suitable to invest in these products? And the last question that I want, uh, you know, you to uh, take and uh, we'll conclude there is, what has been your personal learning? Because uh, at the starting of the you know session, you said that investing is an art and science. We will leave science for some other day. Let's talk about art. And I believe wo art is not in commerce. So, uh, you know, what have what has this? How have you mastered this art? And what has been your biggest uh, learning lessons from in you know being an investor in the Indian capital markets? So, what do you? These two questions, and we conclude there. Sure. Thank you. So uh, first thing, let me tell you that at MK, uh, we have now evolved quite well in terms of our product offerings to the investors. So we have uh, created two partitions. We have something what we call the classical alpha strategy, and then we have a smart alpha strategy. So when I talk about classical alpha strategy, it's about bottoms up picking. It's about investing, you know, across businesses where we see growth. Uh, you know, finding trends, those kind of things. And when I talk about smart alpha investing, it's more about product factor based investing. It's about investing in the right pedigree of the businesses, management, the kind of the, uh, you know, the track record that they would have. And you have equal weighted kind of a portfolio over there. So it's more of our passive investing, but in an active way. Right. So that is our smart alpha strategy, which is where we have two products, MK Lead and MK 12. On the MK classical uh, strategy, we have MK Capital Builder, which has been our flagship product for a while now. Uh, and then we also have an AIF, which is MK Emerging Stars Fund, which is a small cap fund, uh, which we've been running for almost two and a half years now. So these are this is largely how we have structured ourselves. And we believe that uh, both these uh, products have a very, very niche offering for the profile of the investors, uh, depending on each of them. And uh, I think the second part, you asked me about my learnings, uh, my art. So Sandeepo, let me be very honest with you that there is one, one of the big things when I joined uh, uh, Probity Research, which is when with, with Mr. Nirmal Jain, and there was a gentleman called Mr. Bharat Paraje. Uh, a lot of people in the markets would know him very well, and I respect him very well. Uh, 
there was there was a, a group of us who were sitting there and somebody asked him that how does this badla work you know in those days this current futures right. it used to be known as badla so he tried to explaining for no somebody else actually tried to explain that person for one minute and then uh, that guy couldn't grasp it so bharat said don't worry i know how you have to learn it he said you first do one trade in badla then next day there will be a debit note you will have to pay the loss for it and that's how you will know you will become a master of what is badla so the point i'm trying to make is that everything that we have learned is by paying price so the eco risk module that i have you know that we have created is actually all the mistakes that we have done in our investing in different different stocks so when we realize that this was the mistake and we don't want to repeat it right so that's it became a part of our checklist so that is where the learning has been right right so you say that uh, you know you you've learned through the eye of Uh, master your art by constantly evolving and learning well that's a lesson for all of us so uh, you know the, just two trivia things before we you know uh, end to this session so i asked uh, on the poll that nifty 13000 13000 uh, 13, by diwali uh, 44% people feel yes uh, uh, feel yes and the other rest uh, you know are not quite convinced uh, also uh, we asked on the poll is investing in art or science 58% people say art i think uh, and sci- and you know around close to 40% people say that it's an art so it's been a pleasure hosting you mr sachin and i think uh, we have learned a lot about how you invest and uh, you know our philosophy at uh, as a as a wealth manager at pmsif world has always been that we try to help investors make informed investments and i'm happy today that we uh, could you know have you with us to share your thoughts uh your put your perspective and i will leave investors with the thought that trends uh, uh trends are not just mere trends in the in the literal meaning in investing but they have a lot of uh, other manifestations uh also uh, no stock discussed today in any format should be construed as an advice uh and uh, you know uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll ho- we'll see each other in a lot of other our uh, sessions uh thank you thank you everybody for taking your time out today hoping to see you at the next time thank you sachin thank you sankal po thank you so much it's been a ultimate pleasure thank you so thank you. much everyone uh, thank you for your support thank you thank you